large numbers of exhibitions on architects such as Frank Gehry, Gio Ponti, Zaha Hadid, Kazuyo Sejima, Enric Miralles, um, Ray Kawakubo, and Comme des Garçons, uh, fashion designers, among others. Uh, her most recent MOCA exhibition uh, project, The Skin and Bones, Parallels Between Practices in Fashion and Architecture, uh, was presented in Los Angeles, Tokyo, and London. And of course, tonight we'll be talking about that exhibition. She's currently working on exhibitions on the work of Morphosis and Balnoga Studio, which will open at MOCA in 2009. Uh, Brooke Hodge is a contributor to Wallpaper, the magazine, and also writes Seeing Things, a bi-weekly design uh, column for The Moment, the New York Times Magazine's blog. Uh, she's the organizing curator for MOCA's presentation of the, the sculptor Louise Bourgeois. And to add to all these great um, endeavors, uh, she really changed my life a couple of years ago by introducing me to In-N-Out Burgers in California, <laughs> which I think is much more important than all those exhibitions. <laughs> so please welcome Brooke Hodge. And thanks to John Yoder and to Mark Robbins for inviting me to Syracuse. I was just saying to Julia Zerniak that I think I'm the only person in town who's excited about the weather today because there actually is weather, which we don't get in Southern California. We just get sort of relentless sunshine. Uh, I know you don't feel sorry for me. But <laughs> and fires. Right, I'm really here because I'm from Kingston, Ontario, which is just across the lake from you. So, <laughs> um, no, I'm really here because I really wanted to see all the great things that Mark and the rest of the faculty have been doing here at Syracuse because I've heard so much about it. So, thank you for having me. Um, for many people, the fact that fashion and architecture share a great deal in common might come as a surprise because there are such obvious differences between the two disciplines. Fashion is ephemeral, it's maybe more commercial, it changes with the seasons, it can be seen as frivolous sometimes, and architecture is of course permanent, durable, often monumental. Fashion uses soft materials and architecture uses hard, rigid materials, and the scales of course are very different. The point of origin for both fashion and architecture is the human body, and both fashion and architecture protect and shelter us, and they both provide means for us to express our identities, whether it's us as individuals or a client expressing an identity through a building. Over time, designers in both fields have drawn inspiration and technical strategies from each other, and the vocabulary der derived from architecture has been applied to clothing, um, such as architect words such as architectonic, constructed, sculptural, structural, and architects have adopted many, adapted many sartorial strategies from fa the fashion world, such as printing, pleating, draping, wrapping, weaving, and folding surfaces and materials. My own interest in the parallels between fashion and architecture developed in 2000 when I was still at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and um, we decided to give an award uh, Excellence in Design Award to the fashion designer Ray Kawakubo of Comme des Garçons. Um, the award program was very interesting because it was developed by Jorge Silvetti, who was the chair, as a way to bring other designers into the school and to have the architects, landscape architects and urban designers be exposed to other creative disciplines that they might end up working with in the future or who might provide inspiration to them in their own work. And so Comme des Garçons was going to receive the award and we decided to do an exhibition in the gallery at the school. And while I was working on that exhibition and writing a small essay for the book, I was struck by the similarities, the way that the vocabulary was, that was used to describe Comme des Garçons' work was very similar to vocabulary that is used to describe architecture. And that started me thinking about the fact that there are probably many more parallels than just the vocabulary between fashion and architecture. And after that, um, shortly after that, I went to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles for my job interview. And I was asked, what exhibition would you do here if you got the job? And so 
sort of recklessly, I think, I proposed fashion and architecture and um, got the job and then embarked on this, what turned out to be a very big project. The exhibition opened at MOCA in 2006 in November and it then traveled to Tokyo and then the final venue was London last spring where it just ended in August. And I think that some of the fashion design students from Syracuse because of the semester, um, junior semester in London, might have seen the show at Somerset House. So um, that's exciting to, to know that people here might have seen it. Um, the mm -hmm. exhibition takes the 19, took the 1980s as its point of departure. This was a time of very significant design advances and events that contributed to cultural shifts in each field. In April 1981, Yoji Yamamoto and Rei Kawakubo showed deconstructed clothing for the first time in Paris. These were their first collections that they showed in Paris. They had shown in Tokyo before, and the fashion world was really taken by surprise. And on the left, you see a sweater by Rei Kawakubo for Comme des Garcons, and on the right, some deconstructed outfits by Yoji Yamamoto. At almost the same time, Bernard Schumi won the competition to design Parc de la Villette in Paris, which was the project that introduced the ideas of deconstruction in architecture to a larger audience. Designers in both fields were struggling to liberate themselves from convention and were experimenting with new forms and were open to ideas and techniques from other disciplines to inspire radically different approaches to design. And you'll hear about, <clears throat> sorry, you've heard a lot about deconstruction in the past and um, what was interesting to me when I started working on this project was to really look back at deconstruction and architecture because that was something that was very exciting to me when I was a student and then to really look back and kind of reevaluate it and to see how it hasn't really continued in the same way in architecture for many reasons but in fashion it has continued and even mainstream designers have adopted deconstructed techniques with clothing design to make things that are more mainstream appear rather edgy. So it's interesting how in fashion it really was more of a natural adoption and it didn't come from literary theory and fashion that we know of. It came from a natural inclination to take things apart since fashion designers are themselves putting things together. De <clears throat> Deconstructivist architecture was influenced by literary theory and philosophy but in some cases, such as Frank Gehry's own house, which is on the right, it, used, it is used more literally with parts of the house being dismantled and reassembled using off-the-shelf industrial materials. In a similar way, um, the Belgian designer Martin Margiela appropriates vintage clothing and reassembles them into completely new garments. So the dress that's on the left is uh, a tea dress that he's made of more than 12 different vintage dresses. Also in 1982, an exhibition at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology called Intimate Architecture um, was organized by Susan Sidlaskis and it examined the work of eight fashion designers from an architectural point of view. And this was the very first time that an exhibition had looked at fashion from an architectural point of view. And it was very influential to many in the fashion world, but it was little known really in the architecture world. For many, <clears throat> for many years, fashion designers such as Pierre Cardin, Courage, Balenciaga, and Paco Rabanne have been conversant with architectural forms and principles, but it's only recently that I think a more true cross-fertilization has developed as architects are paying closer attention to fashion. Fashion houses are commissioning architects, such as Herzog and Demeron. This is the image of the Prada epicenter in Tokyo from 2003, and advances in technology are enabling architects to build more complex forms and look to fashion for inspiration, methods of construction, and for the ways that flat cloth can be manipulated into more complex forms to fit the curves of the human body. The exhibition itself, Skin and Bones, was organized thematically and opened with more abstract um, themes of shelter and identity. The connection between clothing and shelter obviously dates back as far as prehistoric times when people used animal skins to cover themselves into fashion exterior walls for crude dwellings. Contemporary practitioners of both fashion and architecture have continued to address the human imperative for shelter in ingenious ways. 
These are views of Shigeroban's relief housing in Rwanda from 1995. And it was, he developed this system um, after the genocides in Rwanda for the refugees that were um, needed housing. And the, he also used this system in Kobe after the earthquake. And he developed a system of paper tubes that he's since taken in many directions. But it was very ingenious because the paper tubes were very light. They could be transported very easily. And they could be assembled on the ground with very little instruction. They could also be dropped from a plane or a helicopter. So in the case of an area where there might have been a mudslide or an earthquake, trucks didn't need to get through on roads that might be damaged. The, um, the supplies could just be dropped right where they were needed. And then the covering of the tent is uh, the blanket that's issued by the UN to refugees. And so made use of very minimal materials, and, um, but was very effective. These are um, images from a collection by a designer named Tess Giberson, who's based in New York City, and it's her structure collection from the fall and winter of 2003-2004. And in it, she was interested in the idea of what makes a community, and she decided that a community needed a kind of structure or a meeting place and people to work together to do something. And so she, her show started off with the very um, simple structure that you can see in the upper left. And gradually each model came out on the runway and, and took parts of her clothing off and hung them on the structure. So that by the end, all of the models were in simple white slips and the structure was completely enclosed. And um, it was a really interesting way that a fashion designer took the idea of shelter um, and, and turned it into a collection very in a very abstract way almost. Clothes and buildings are both used to project identity, both personal identity, political identity, religious, cultural identity. We choose the clothes that we wear to project our identity to others, and buildings can also be used to create or reinforce an identity. Many designers have used clothing in different ways to express the abstract concept of identity. This is Victor and Rolf's Russian doll collection from the fall and winter 1999-2000. And probably a number of the fashion people in the audience are familiar with the collection, but so I'll just give a brief overview. For the runway show, Victor and Rolf at that time were producing more conceptual collections um, with one-off pieces. For the runway show, there was only one model, and you can see her in the video that's projected in the back. And she, was, um, she came out in a very straightforward dress, which is the dress that you see right in the front. It's a very coarse, coarsely woven, dress made out of jute and gradually the Victor and Rolf came out and they put new clothes on top of her and so it was like the Russian doll sort of being built up from the smallest to the most massive but the other thing that the collection expressed was the change in the woman's identity basically from her origins in this very coarse dress to more opulent clothing sort of as she moved through the stages in life or progressed her stature increased and then at the very end she was, had these very heavy clothes on, and it was, she stood very still on a very small turntable, and after each garment was placed on the body, the designers left and the turntable revolved. And then they came out, and the final outfit is the big cloak that you can see on the left-hand side, which was almost entombing her in this um, garment that was made from the same fabric as the initial dress. Hussein Chalayan's Afterwards collection from fall, winter 2001, 2000, 2001, also addresses issues related to his personal identity as a London-based Turkish Cypriot who's not living in his own country anymore. He's always felt a sort of sense of uh, exile or, or a absence from being away from his own country. And at the time that he was doing the collection, he also um, identified with the refugees of the Balkan conflict in the 1990s. And his collection suggested the necessity of leaving one's own home in a time of, of trouble with nothing but one's own clothes on, on one's back. And in the um, show, the models came out um, and they the set was placed and they um, took the slip covers off the chair the slip covers turn into dresses. They put the dresses on. Um, you can see that happening up here. 
So these are slip covers. They came in very simple white dresses. Took the slip covers off the chairs, put, transformed them into dresses, and then um, in the next, in the last model came out. So the model stood there with the dresses. The chairs then folded up into attache cases or suitcases, and the last woman came out and she took the central disc out of the coffee table, stepped into the center, and then it became this amazing skirt, which is also very architectural in its own right. Um, and then they left the stage and there was nothing left on the stage at all since they'd taken everything away with them. There was also a shelf with um, individual objects on it and earlier models had come out with pockets in their coats shaped like certain things and they would take those objects off and place them into their pockets. So it was a really interesting way that Chalayan um, investigated the idea of identity in his own work. This is an image of the Arab World Institute in Paris. And um, as architecture is an interesting um, case study of presenting identity in a building, Jean Nouvel designed this building. And it represents all the Arab, Arab cultures that are present in France. And his idea was to create this screen wall that's based on the Musharabi, or screen that's used in um, Islamic culture to screen women from the public. And so it's a, a, like a latticework screen, but with a beautiful Islamic design. And so the women could see outside, but men passing by couldn't see inside. And the whole idea of this building also is that these openings are like apertures, and they were mechanized, and they would open and close to let the sun in and out. But um, like many high-tech buildings, the high-tech didn't quite work, but still a very um, impressive building. The similarities in the creative process followed by fashion designers and architects are striking. And um, when I started working on the show, I should say that my background is architectural history. I have a master's in architectural history. So I'm not an architect and I'm not a fashion designer. But through my work with exhibitions of architecture, I've been involved a lot in understanding the creative process of architects. And so I was interested to see that the way that fashion designers work can be very similar to architects. Fashion designers and architects both begin by taking ideas and working out their practical requirements and translating them into three-dimensional structures. And that's a very simplistic definition of what both do. But you can see that the, the genesis of where something begins is quite similar. Um, they begin with flat two-dimensional material, and they transform it to create complex three-dimensional forms. Both fashion designers and architects sketch, make study models, and I've always thought that a dress pattern has a lot of similarities to a plan or another um, type of architectural drawing that is really a set of instructions for getting something built. These are images of Narciso Rodriguez at work in his studio. And uh, the fashion designers in the audience will see that or will recognize the tape marks here that he uses to create the seam lines for his dresses. And he's very concerned with precise construction and fit and the relationship of the fabric and the garment to the human body and spends hours just examining these. Um, first, he makes the prototype in muslin. And then he, then he makes it out of a darker cloth and then uses the tape lines and then adjusts, makes many, many precise adjustments until he's satisfied with the final garment. And, of course, Frank Gehry's model for his house in Santa Monica. These are images um, of the work of a young architect in Los Angeles named Elena Manfredini. And she teaches at SciArc. She's a graduate of UCLA. And she's also trained as an engineer. Um, she's originally from Bologna in Italy. And she's recently incorporated fashion design into her practice, and more recently even um, object design and furniture design. Since 2004, she's generated several one-of-a-kind collections, fashion collections, that she's designed using the creative process that she knows as an architect. She uses 3D rendering software, such as Maya, which was originally created for animation and video and game development, as well as for architectural applications. She um, creates a 3D digital model 
of a garment and then flattens it out to create a pattern. And so she's really going in the reverse um, rather than working on a dress form or on a, on a human model. She's working digitally in the computer. Um, she then uses the laser cutter that is computer programmed to cut the individual pieces of a garment and to create the decorative pattern on the surface. And so this is one of the dresses and one of the patterns. And what's interesting is she has no training in fashion and so there, there is no tailoring and no real construction to the garment. So it's really based on wrapping the body and on the patterns that the laser cutter can create. Um, but her work sort of had a kind of finite um, place that it could go to. But then she was approached by Nike and she <clears throat> developed um, last year a line of garments for Nike's Macro React line. And you can see how the laser cutting that she was using in the garments then translated into these clothes for Nike, which um, make a lot of sense for athletic use because it's ventilation and, and it's also an attractive pattern. Her experimentation on a small scale has also in influenced her architecture practice. And I found that very interesting to see how she can experiment with clothing <clears throat> that's at a manageable scale for her and then how that can sort of turn back on itself and come back and inform her architecture practice. And I'll, I'll show some images at the end of the pavilion that she designed for the Beijing Biennial last year that use a lot of the techniques that she developed and the process that she developed for designing clothes. Both fashion designers and architects develop techniques of construction, or what I like to call tectonic strategies, to shape the envelope, the spatial volume, and the surface or the skin of individual garments and buildings. And um, one of these is geometry. Geometry, of course, has long been employed to generate form and architecture. And on the left, you see Kazuyo Seijima and Ryu and Nishizawa's um, Kanazawa Museum in, in Japan. Museum of the 21st Century, and on the right you see Preston Scott Cohen. It's a rendering for the Tel Aviv Museum, which is um, under construction now. Preston Scott Cohen's work with descriptive and projective geometry begins with early drawings, and it has result began. He used to make very intricate hand drawings, um, and now it's resulted in intricate and complex work as he explores ways to use unusual geometric forms to create extraordinary spatial effects. And it's very interesting to see him at the stage of actually building some of these very complicated ideas. Um, on the left is the Max Reinhardt House, a project by Peter Eisenman, unbuilt project using the Mobius strip to generate the form. And on the right is a dress by Mi Jin Yoon, who is an architect who teaches at MIT. And she also used the Mobius strip to create this unusual garment. And the garment, as you see it on the figure, is enclosed, but then it has this system of double zippers so that when it's unzipped, it gradually unravels and creates different spatial conditions and a different form on the body. Rigid ge geometrical forms appear less often in fashion design. However, ex explorations of geometry to generate form have appeared frequently in the work of Isabel Toledo. And Isabel is based in New York City. And this is a dress that she designed in 1988 called the packing dress. She was very interested in designing clothes that would be easy for women to travel with. And she developed this dress that's based on two simple circular pieces of fabric. Um, one side has the holes cut out for the head and the arms, and the other side is solid. And, but when the, body, when the dress is put on the body, or in this case the mannequin, then the sh shape changes completely and it's transformed by, by gravity. Structural skin is often used in architecture to define the continuous external surface that covers the structural framework or bones of a building. And in recent years, many architects have developed sophisticated and innovative building skins. These are um, on the right, Toyo Ito's Todd's Omote Sando building in Tokyo um, for the fashion design house Todd's. And on the left is one of his early models for the project. This project features a surface made of glass and crisscross load-bearing concrete beams. It's at once light and strong 
and its, a marriage, its marriage of skin and bones creates a pattern that references the trees that line the street in front of it. It's a key example of, stru of structural skin or the idea of structural skin in architecture in which the skin and the bones of the building or the surface and the structure are integrated into one surface and it, it enables an open interior space uninterrupted by structural supports and is especially well suited to retail space. Here we have the Seattle Library um, by Rem Koolhaas, OMA, from 2004. And many of you are probably familiar with the building. Um, it was interesting to me when I was working on the show to see the model that was used by the architects when they were explaining what their idea to the client, to the chief librarian in Seattle, that they actually made the model to separate the skin from the interior um, functional parts of the building so that they could show this skin suspended above the sort of guts of the building. In fashion, the garment itself serves as a metaphorical second skin, but products of innovative computer programmed industrial knitting machine developed by Issei Miyake and Dai Fujiwara since 1997 draw direct parallels to the structural skins being developed in contemporary architecture. And this is an image of Miyake's APOC, which was he began developing in 1997. The fabric, the texture, and the completed knit, the components of a fully finished garment, are made in a single process. Continuous knit tubes are produced from which seamless garments can be extruded by cutting around lines of demarcation customized to the wearer's needs. Structure is incorporated into the knitting process and the traditional cut and sew assembly method of garment construction is no longer required. And when Miyake, he's since taken this line into many directions and it's the line that he's most interested in working on himself these days. But when he started, um, he, this was the sort of pure form of APOC, and APOC stands for a piece of cloth. This, was, this is the knit tube, and you would see the seam lines in the fabric. And ideally, what he hoped was that people would come to the APOC store and just buy a length of fabric from this huge roll and cut out their own garments, whatever they wanted to, from this. So there were many different garments that you could cut out of the fabric. And he was also interested in minimizing waste of fabric. But he, they found that people, consumers, weren't really interested in cutting the fabric themselves. They wanted something. They were kind of afraid to do that, I think. So um, now they make finished garments using this process, but it's not up to the consumer to actually transform the, the tube into the garment themselves. Fashion designers have long looked to architecture for ways to construct interesting volumetric shapes for garments. And now that architects have the capability of building much more complex curved building forms, they are looking more frequently to fashion for inspiration. These are images of Junya Watanabe's Techno Couture Soiree collection from fall, winter 2000, 2001. And Junya Watanabe um, worked as a pattern maker for Comme des Garcons and was very talented and was mentored by Ray Kawakubo and was given his own line within the house. And he's known for working with textile companies to develop his own textiles for the fabrics. And what is so beautiful about these clothes are that when they arrived, when the crates arrived and we were taking the pieces out, um, each thing is a completely flat piece that's unfolded. Um, this one, for example, is like a honeycomb or a sponge that comes flat and then it is unfolded to create these incredible volumes. And so he's really um, integrated the structure of the garment into the development of the textile itself. And again, Toyo Ito and an unbuilt project for the Forum for Music, Dance, and Visual Culture in Ghent. And on the left, you see his study model using fabric um, where he's looking at how the stretching of the fabric and the um, sewing of the fabric together can create these interesting honeycomb spaces that um, he used in his building in the um, project. More recently, many different tectonic strategies are being adopted from fashion design by architects as ways to create more interesting surfaces and spaces for their buildings. 
Frank Gehry in Disney Concert Hall, I like to think of this as a wrapped volume, and struck me um, just as Come Digger Sons Body Meets Dress, Dress Meets Body Collection, also known as the Bump Collection from spring, summer 1997. Both designers are creating forms that were very unusual and, and for us in architecture or in fashion, we might be you know, more used to these kind of forms because we're involved in the design process. But for the public, these buildings suddenly appeared. And if you think of Bilbao, when it opened, the public had was just blown away by this new type of building. And um, so Disney Hall, I know Frank Gehry has often talked about his, the influence on him of looking at the drapery folds of classic Greek, Greek statues and also the billowing sails of sailboats and ships. And um, Ray Calacubo um, doesn't talk a lot about her creative process, but she said that this collection, she was interested in the silhouettes of women who were wearing backpacks or carrying purses or carrying um, baby Bjorns in the front and how that would change the silhouette of their body and how there was still something very beautiful about these deformed silhouettes. Um, recently in my work on the Louise Bourgeois exhibition, I started to think that Ray Kawakubo must have been looking at Louise Bourgeois' work because Louise designed a number of weird, weirdly shaped latex costumes in the 1970s that also deformed the body. And so that was an interesting parallel. And if any of you saw the October issue of Wallpaper Magazine, they coincidentally featured guest edited sections by both Ray Kawakubo and Louise Bourgeois. Folding and pleating are strategies that are shared, seem to be shared most frequently by architects and fashion designers. In folding, one piece, one flat piece of material becomes a volumetric form through the introduction of creases. Pleating is a subset of folding in which regularly spaced folds or creases occur at close intervals. And of course, in architecture, folding usually doesn't happen literally, although it can, but um, is often suggested by the way that a building is constructed. And this is Winka Dubledam's Greenwich Street project in New York City with a folded, or the idea of a folded glass facade. And another collection by Comme des Garçons called Clustering Beauty from 1998 in which uh, Kawakubo used neutral colored fabrics and investigated many different ways of pleating, draping, and folding <coughs> multiple layers of fabric to create different shapes. Issey Miyake um, has, of course, been a pioneer with pleating in contemporary fashion. And his groundbreaking Pleats Please line featured pioneering work with pleating techniques. Traditionally, fabric is pressed and pleated before being sewn. But Miyake reversed the process, creating oversized garments that shrink after pleats are applied. A piece of polyester is cut and sewn in the shape of a given garment and a much larger shape than you would imagine and then sandwiched and pleated between layers of paper and fed into a heat press machine. The memory of the fabric holds the pleats and when the paper is cut open the finished garment is revealed. So you can see the process here from the garment being sandwiched between the paper then when it's flattened out um, for the heat press machine and then the paper being torn away to reveal the garment. And then the interesting thing about these very geometric garments are that, again, they take a completely different shape when they're put on the human body. And many fashion designers, especially the Japanese and the Belgian fashion designers, are very interested in the space between the body and the garment. So they think as much about the interior space of garment as they do about the surface. This is the Floral Street Bridge by Wilkinson Air in London. Um, which gives the effect of a pleated structure stretching between two buildings. Draping is um, used also in both fashion and architecture. Shigeru Bond's well-known curtain wall house in Tokyo, in which a giant curtain um, is installed on the outside of the building to create the covering. Um, and he takes this domestic idea and blows it up to something on the, um, that can be used on the exterior of the building. Unfortunately, it's not in very good shape anymore and the curtains aren't really used, but the idea of it was very suggestive and it um, 
was interesting that he literally took the idea of draping with a curtain to and closed the building. Office Da, this is um, one of their early house projects in Weston, Massachusetts. It's unbuilt, where they wrapped a taut skin of corrugated metal around a wood frame house. On one facade, the skin becomes looser and more evocative of domestic interiors as it's distorted and manipulated into gentle curtain-like folds. And a lot of their work since then has taken these ideas and they've successfully built a number of projects or designing larger scale projects using ideas um, from textile um, development and fashion design. Printing is another um, device that is used obviously by fashion designers and less obviously by architects. This is the Santa Catarina Market in Barcelona by EMBT architects, Benedetta Taliabue and Enrique Marias. And it has this beautiful uh, printed roof structure that um, when it was designed and the, the pattern for it, it's all tiled, ceramic tiles. And the image is based on photographs of the fruits and vegetables that were sold in the market. Um, and then they were blown up and pixelated. And they took apart the various parts of the roof and to figure out the, how the patterns would work and how the structure would work. And it's very much like a dress pattern. And um, Benedetta Taliabue likes to think of it almost like a Dries Van Noten skirt that's laid over the top of the building. And these are some images from one of Dries Van Noten's collections. He's a Belgian designer who um, is known for developing his own prints based on often ethnic textiles and, and prints and patterns found in other cultures. Weaving is um, something that's present in most fashion in the very structure of fabric itself. And Herzog and Demerol have used weaving or created a woven skin for the National Stadium in Beijing. These are renderings and also an image of the model. And of course, everybody has now seen it over and over and over again, summer in the Olympics. Um, so you know what it looks like in real life. Um, for the stadium, a skin of woven steel encloses the intricate lattice steel framework beneath the, the basket weave of steel that composes it, and the basket weave of steel that composes its facade is also its load-bearing structure. And I think that Jacques Herzog actually said about it that its skin is made of bones. And so it was an interesting um, coming together of these two ideas in one building. And as an interesting aside, Jacques Herzog's mother was a tailor, so he grew up surrounded by lots and lots of textiles and understanding about the construction of garments. And so their practice, um, they were wonderful participants in the exhibition with a number of projects included, um, including a library, the Eberswald Library that has a printed um, facade. Cantilever is common in, in architecture, but less common in fashion. And in architecture, these are two good examples, the ICA in Boston on the left, and Zaha Hadid's Vitra Fire Station, now exhibition space in Germany. Um, but I'd like to show these two images of Victor and Rolf's uh, coat dress from 2003, 2004, and Yoji Yamamoto's felt dress from fall, winter, 1996-97 where um, they take the idea of cantilever and use it in a, in a um, dress form that's very architectural. More complex projects begin to show a fusion or a synthesis between fashion and architecture, and we can expect to see more fruitful developments in this direction in the future. The work of architects Peter Testa and Devin Weiser of Santa Monica has particularly close, a particularly close relationship to fashion. They have been conducting extensive research into new technical textiles such as carbon fiber that can be adapted for architectural applications using traditional textile construction techniques such as braiding, weaving, or knitting. And um, what was interesting when I was working on, <clears throat> on the exhibition was to go to their studio to see what they were working on and to see that they had a lot of images of fashion design um, all over the place. And 
I wasn't familiar with this dress by Yoshiki Hishinuma, who used to work with Issei Miyake. And it's called the two-way inside-out tape dress. And the tape is strategically placed to wrap the body, but it's also um, heat sensitive. So when it's worn, the idea is that, th that it would change color. So if you just see this dress on a mannequin, the tape that looks beige here is actually red or blue, but it changes to beige when it's on a human body. And then Testa and Weiser were developing a beach house that was their take on prefab housing with these polycarbonate panels that would be wrapped in prepreg tape that's used on the fuselage of jet planes that's impregnated with um, carbon fiber and so and is very strong and so they took the Hishinuma idea of wrapping the body in tape and wrap their building in tape in strategic places to create um, both private and public areas. And these are images of their models for um, various carbon fiber buildings. They are really, um, I think, at the forefront of research into using carbon fiber in architecture. So it will be interesting to see if they are, they are successful in building anything. It's still very expensive. And their idea is that they're, they could cut out the middleman or the construction um, industry, ideally, because they the carbon fiber could be brought to the site and actually knitted or braided into a building and it creates its own structure. Um, so it's pretty far ahead of, I think, actually happening. But it's interesting to see um, the ideas that they're working on. As the boundaries between fashion and architecture continue to blur, further par parallels along with an increasingly rich and vital dialogue are sure to develop between the two disciplines. Architects who've experimented directly with the design of garments will begin to translate their investigations into the realm of architecture. Elena Manfredini has already begun this process in her own <coughs> practice with her design for the West Coast Pavilion at the Beijing Biennial. Fashion designers will continue to look at the materials and methods of architecture to create ever more ingenious garments, and this cross-fertilization may result in the development of increasingly hybrid practices like that of Testa and Weiser and Elena Manfredini. The work you've just seen shows just some of the interweavings of fashion and architecture, and one can only imagine the promise that lies in the threads that have yet to be connected. Thank you. Sure, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, just um, before we um, have questions, I want to let you know that there's a wonderful book, and we'll have a book signing after this, um, and I'm sure Brooke will um, autograph it pressed. Okay. Sure. This is good. Thanks. It's, it's actually remarkable to see this relationship between fashion and architecture, and also to think about the ways in which we have to think about the most general kinds of conditions and then specific or eccentric conditions, which fashion designers always have to look at, and we do as well as architects. And I wanted to recognize one of our first collaborations between uh, VPA. We have our own wonderful fashionista, Karen Baki here, and my wonderful colleague, uh, Dean uh, Ann Clark, uh, who's collaborating on bringing um, Brooke here from Los Angeles. And uh, how many fashion students? Please, somebody raise your hand. Fashion students? Even, even if you're not, it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Look how many fashion students came. OK, I know Richard Thank isn't a fashion student. Thank you all of you for coming. <laughs> from far away on campus. Anyway, this is just a, a first of what we hope will be uh, multiple collaborations. It's a very, very good and, and apt um, partnership. So uh, thank you very much. I also want to suggest, since this is our last um, lecture of the season, that these, as seamless as all of this seems to go, these things don't happen by themselves. And we have a fantastic lecture and exhibitions committee and uh, the chairs of which are both sitting in the front row. So I want to thank John Yoder for all of his work. <laughs> and I'd like to take uh, a moment to thank Jean-Francois for all of his help uh, working on exhibitions. And he's stepping down as chair. And uh, that goes to uh, Marissa Tyrone. And uh, so I want to thank both of them.
sort of a warm up. Um, <laughs> we have questions for Brooke about the, the lecture. Yeah, I have a question about the Um, they have done other experiments, definitely. They had in the exhibition at MOCA some new models that they had made, and also they are, you might have seen their work in the Extreme Textiles exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt Museum, um, and that was where I first became familiar with their work. But so the skin can look different. It can look, in this case, it looks more woven, but they've created skins that also look more braided or knitted, and so it's really interesting how they, and they create their own computer programs to develop the skins. Um, so it's interesting how they can um, take those processes. And I think what's interesting actually is that Devin Weiser, who is one half of that firm, actually, um, I think she went to RISD and she worked as a hat designer before she went into architecture. So she has that background um, in fashion and working with textiles. And then Peter Testa used to work for CISA for many years and taught at MIT and now they're out in California and I think that they're finding that in Southern California they have access to a lot of um, manufacturers and processes that they didn't have access to on the, on the East Coast um, because people that are out there for the automotive industry and the movie industry and, and other things um, have, have been really useful to them. Oh. <laughs> well, John Fula, for example, well, his shoes are really I like shoes <laughs> a lot. Whole <laughs> <laughs> House has aligned with another designer. Right. That's actually Ian Fuller. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.